I left Charleston in a rental SUV and set out for Curry, North Carolina, by way of nearby Wilmington, with an overnight stop at the Hilton Wilmington Riverside. I got a quick glimpse of the water from my room before heading down to meet new friend and fan, actor Mark Jeffrey Miller, who was based in Wilmington. We took a stroll down the waterfront, which has some of the charms of Charleston. Our restaurant had a raised bed garden at the entrance, and we chatted about mutual friends, acting, and gardening till the sun was setting. Sunset on the waterfront is tough to surpass, and I definitely want to revisit Wilmington when I have more time. Next morning, all was still on the river. As I left for the short drive to Curry and Lizzie Lou's family farm. Elizabeth and Nanny met me driving in. Today I am in Curry, North Carolina with Elizabeth from Lizzie Lou's family farm. Now usually I visit the people that know me or that follow me on Late Bloomer, but I have been following Elizabeth for two years on Instagram and fell in love with her photography of her farm and her animals and I just had to come and meet her. We're going to have a chat and see her farm. Sound good? Yes ma'am. <laughs> the children in my family called me Lizzie and whenever I was still living in town I had a big front yard garden and some chickens in the backyard and I, I had a little Facebook page called Lizzie Lou's Home and Garden at uh -huh. that point. And so when we started talking about the farm we tossed around some other names mm -hmm. and it seemed like Lizzie Lou was, was what was going to stick and so we went with Lizzie Lou's Family Farm because it rolled so nice. This was uh, Malachi Farm and Stables and they boarded horses here for about 13 years and my mom is still a big horse fan and um, it just that some of the children aged out as far as horseback riding and my mother shattered her arm and was no longer able to, to ride. The farm was empty for probably about six months to eight months and um, we kept coming out and saying how, you know, how sad it was to see an empty farm and my dad said, you know, if you guys want to try and do something, let's look at getting some cows. And so at that point, we bought three cows, uh -huh. and we, we were driving back and forth from town, and as we got a few more animals, we got some more, a couple goats, and we got a, some more chickens, no, 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 no. It, it became one of those things that we, we decided that driving back and forth was a little too much, and Impractical. we said, can we move out onto the property, and they said, absolutely, and then it has grown from there. But now you and your husband, Randall, have been together for a while, right? 15 years this year and you had something amazing happen last year. Yes, yes. We was had, it last year now? This is July. It was January 27th. This year? Yes. And what happened? We <laughs> had twin girls and um, it was a big surprise. Since I had watched my sister's children for many years, we had said we weren't gonna have any children. And then we decided last minute we would have a baby and we got two. Oh, that's wonderful. It is. Now, are these going to be farm girls? They are. <laughs> they are already farm girls. We have 11 cows right now. There are eight pigs on the farm, but two pregnant sows. Probably around 30 chickens, a couple geese, a couple ducks. The birds, we use them more for pasture maintenance than for anything else. They help spread manure. They help with parasite control. And actually, a lot of their eggs, the majority of their eggs, go back and feed our pigs. I think it's something that if you're wanting to do, you kind of have to just jump into. If I had sat around and said, I don't know how to do this, and I don't know how to do that, then we wouldn't have anything we have here. I grow a garden probably bigger than what is within my capability. With the animals, we just, you know, learned as we went. Um, I have a great veterinarian who is really good about when she comes and helps me work cattle or checking the pigs, giving me information and tidbits, what I need to know if I'm doing something she thinks I should do different. You just kind of have to learn as you go. Because like you said, many of us, we weren't raised on farms. We weren't raised with growing our own food. And I, this is our fourth year farming. And I've gotten to where we're putting so much of our own food, both meat and vegetable on the table now. I mean, it's the best feeling ever to know where where you look at a plate and it's full of your food. This was the first year we've done an on-farm market and we decided to do that because we had the twins. I have in the past I've always done my heirloom baskets and that was kind of a segue for me. When we when we first started the farm we didn't have any meat. 
I didn't have that many eggs, but I wanted to start getting our name out and putting a product out. So we started doing the heirloom baskets and um, that's where kind of a CSA type share where I signed people up and they got a basket each week. In fact, I'll be doing some of those later today. And so our baskets, they're, they're really, they're pretty, I think. They come with flowers, they come with vegetables, and I try and change them as much as possible. And I did that too, because I like to kind of grow some of those funky vegetables that you don't really see at the store. Purple like. beans or, you know, yellow cucumbers, you know, dip, lots of heirlooms. I wanted other people to be able to appreciate that. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to keep up with the CSA, which is the basket subscription. And um, I didn't want that pressure on top of me this year. So I said, well, instead, we'll open up a farm market and we'll sell on some Saturdays. And it was kind of hit or miss. And so then I'm having massive amounts of vegetables. It's more than I can eat, can, can preserve, can put up for baby food. So I said, I'm going to have to do some baskets again. So I advertised just a week or so ago and said, hey, who wants baskets? And all of my, my returns said, me! I do offer eggs when, when they're requested. Because we use so many of our eggs back for feed for the, for the pigs, it's kind of one of those things that I need to know if someone wants eggs. With meat, we offer beef and pork by the cut. So there are animals that are born here on our farm that we raise through, you know, through to processing uh -huh. size and age, and mm -hmm. then and then have processed and broken down, and then I sell by the cut. Because um, we're a cow-calf operation, so we're, we're breeding the cows here on the farm, and they're born, some of those cows, or some of those calves will, will actually be sold. Right. You know, I can't keep my heifer calves because I have a bull. And that bull eats a lot. <laughs> he does, they all eat a lot. And we're actually in the process, every year kind of that we've been here, we've done a, a new pasture. And we're trying to pasture all the way down to as far as the land is cleared. And then we're going to do some silva pasture into the woods. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with silva pasture. Silver? Silvo. Silvo, no. And that, that's kind of a, a mix. So you'll, it's where you don't clear all of the trees. You only clear some of it. Then they, they have a bit of a shade area. It's kind of a mix between woodland and pasture. All of our animals at all times have access to a barn or to housing. Wherever the cows are, wherever the pigs are, wherever the birds are, they have access to one of our barns. The cows are rotationally grazed, which means that we move from paddock to paddock. They go into a paddock, they eat it down, we move to the next one, and around and around, and it gives the pastures time to, to keep growing and to recover. The pigs, mostly, they rotationally graze some, but not as intensively as the cows. And most of the pigs get along with the cows, except for our boar, who doesn't like the bull. We have Cooney Cooney pigs, which are a grazing pig. They're a rare heritage breed from New Zealand. They almost went extinct. And um, some people, some conservatives, br bred them back in um, the 80s. And they didn't get to the United States until the mid 90s. Wow. And, but they, they are growing in popularity so fast because they're a grazing pig. And especially during the summer months when the forage is, is really thick and heavy, they, they, they eat very little grain. Wow, so, that's, why, that's and, wonderful. And they do very little rooting. That's and they wonderful. don't run away. <laughs> yeah. If they get out, they hang out, which was another reason we, we got them. Do you have a hot wire between your, your pastures? Yes, this is all hot wire, what's behind us and behind you. And um, they... They respect it to an extent. The cattle really respect it, but some of the pigs every now and then, the ones that are smart, that they know if I just hit it real fast, I can get a little pop and keep going. Um, we don't have any piglets on the ground right now, but we had a litter last year that loved to swim. And so every time that they could get out, they hid for that pond and would hang out in the edge of the pond. You're on a well here. I am. So you're fortunate. Do you have enough water in your well to support your whole farm? We do. It's a it's a very deep well. Wow. Yeah, and all of all of our water for for livestock, for vegetables, for everything comes from the well. well Same water that that comes into the houses. What do you find is your like absolute biggest issue here in terms of pest or or mildew or whatever? It's bugs. It's bugs. And a lot of that too is probably some of our practices. You know, the beginning of the season, we'll use some organic approved pesticide, but by this time of the year, there's so much work to do. I don't have time for application. And so it is the strong survive plant-wise and the weak go by. We have a lot of beetle right now, and you know, they'll defoliate all of your beans. leaves. Yes, beans. They've just really taken out my, my blue lake bush beans. And squash vine bower is a huge problem here. Everyone I know, 
who grows as well, it's always the race to get squash out. Can you get squash out before the bower gets it? And how do you know the bower is there? Well, I, one, you look for them. It's on the base of the plant, you see a little bit of pulpiness, where, and that's where the bower moth has laid its egg, and then the larva goes inside, and once it's inside, you're done. No, you're done. I kind of let mine go until they're done. I mean, I have plants that are back there in the garden that look horrible, but that are still producing. And if it's gonna produce, then I'll, I'll keep it in the garden until I, I'm pretty much so sure that it's not gonna produce anymore. And then we pull it out and put something else in its place. We're going to get to meet uh, some of Elizabeth's animals and her lovely daughters and husband in a moment. But I just wanted to uh, ask you, how has this whole operation, the family farm changed your life? It, it's changed the, the whole direction of our life. It's really made me a lot more minimalist as far as what I want. I don't need lots of material things, you know. We want a healthy farm. We want to be able to feed our children healthy food. We want to do the same and offer it to the public as much as we can. Family farmers don't get subsidies from the, from the no. U.S. government, but, but industrial agriculture does get enormous subsidies to grow various crops that you know, cotton and and um, canola and corn and, and all those crops that are used for biofuels and everything else. But meanwhile, family farmers are, re are doing the real hard work of saving heirloom seeds, saving heirloom breeds. Nanny, down. <laughs> <laughs> Nanny's trying to get in my car. Yeah. If family farmers got a commensurate amount of subsidies from the U.S. government like industrial agriculture, don't you think a lot more people would be doing this? Absolutely. I, I know so many young people who, who say, you know, I wish I could be doing what you're doing. And, and we, we were very fortunate to walk into the situation where there was a farm that was already here. Right. We just had to build onto it. Yeah. Everyone that is in my circles, they want to know where the food comes from. They want to know it's raised right. They want to know that it's been treated humanely. Exactly. You know, exactly. I think it's very important. Right. Right. Well, we just have to keep doing what I'm going to keep spreading the word. You're going to keep spreading the yes, word locally. And I'm going to hopefully spread the word internationally on YouTube. Check out your family farmers, order a CSA, give them some support and some love. If you can't do that, go to a farmer's market. Yes. I was just in a farmer's market in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and it was absolutely amazing. So you, if you can't grow it yourself, and you can't get on a CSA to, to give some support to a family farmer, then be sure and go to your local farmer's market and buy organic. Oh, I was gonna ask you, she calls her farm beyond organic. Tell me about that. Well, first off, using the term organic is something that um, in most situations you need to be certified right. to use. Right. And so since we are not certified, saying beyond organic is a way for me to let my customers know how what practices we use without saying organic because I'm not supposed to do that and especially with North Carolina law you have to be really careful I can't advertise this grass-fed anything that is a certifiable term I'm not supposed to use that is the beginning but beyond organic it's kind of like I was saying we I try to make the farm as full circle as possible like feeding the eggs from from the birds that help clean the pastures back to the pigs using compost that we've collected manure that has you know aged and been mixed with our dry shavings and stuff mm -hmm. to putting that stuff back into the garden going as full circle as possible and i think because of social media now the same way that i met you there are so many small farms and groups that you can get in and say i'm having this issue how what do i do here and get a, you know tons of responses i'm in a bunch of groups there's one especially is ethical consumer alliance and that one is is a great one for going in there's lots of farmers and consumers in that group and i'll say i have this issue how do you handle this issue and you know people will come back and say this and this in the pastured pig world there are some really big superstars that are really great that have done amazing things with their farms far bigger farms than this on pasture and they were willing to give their advice and help. That's and another thing do. is everyone is so generous in the farming and gardening world. So reach out if you have a question, reach out. Somebody is going to give you yes. some answers. Oh, they're in the wallow. Piggies! They know how to stay cool.
This is our boar, Wilfred, and this is a new boar. He's just not very big yet. This one? Yeah. This is Emmett. Um, he's meant, he'll, he, he'll be able to breed either sow, but he's really meant to be with my other sow. This one is a boar. You'll see his tuskers. Oh, that one. Uh-huh. He'll be able to breed her and then my sow that's in the other pasture. She's over there. The ducks, at night, they will go to the pond, but for the most part, I think because they know it's safe, they hang out near the barn. That's a pretty rooster. He's not an Americana, which is what would lay you like blue and green eggs, but um, he's an Easter egg, so he's like a mutt Americana. Oh, okay. So, um, he's a good boy, though. He watches out for everybody. This duck is my oldest duck. This is Tilly. She's four years old. The brown duck. And um, she's been through lots of other ducks, unfortunately. <laughs> and the geese are very friendly. Everyone said they're going to be so mean. And um, they're not. The only time they're ever a little weird is when they're laying, which she's not laying now. They, they will lay for a few months in the beginning of the year. So she laid probably from December through the beginning of March. Um, and they were huge, big, huge eggs. So make some quiches with some. And um, they're really good for pasta, but I don't do pasta, so. But they're good for baking. Kind of like a, it's like a giant duck egg. Right. And hard as rocks. Wow. Hard. Hard to crack. You say you don't do pasta. Is that because you don't make pasta or because you don't eat bread? Um, because I have MS. Um, I have a seizure disorder with my MS. That's, that was my, my um, first symptom, which is rare. But I went on the autoimmune protocol, which is an elimination diet. And with the elimination diet, you take everything out of your diet that could be causing inflammation. And then you add back individually to see what you can tolerate and what you can't. And so it's no gluten, no dairy, no nightshades, which I've added back, no seeds, no nuts. No eggs. I mean, it was, I say it's minimal, but it's not. When you learn to eat that way, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't become that. I've been able to add nightshades back, seeds, nuts, those type things, but I, I probably won't add gluten and dairy back. I was diagnosed in 2015, and then I just started having massive seizures. That slowed some of the farm growth down um, because it, I thought I was having panic attacks at first. And then um, I woke up and had had a massive grand mal, and then I had several grand mal's. And so we kind of went back and forth, and I saw a neurologist who said, well, it could be these few things. I saw another neurologist who said, I don't know, and then they sent me to Duke. He said, maybe encephalitis, maybe wow. MS, and now they're saying MS. Oh, wow. And I've had a bunch of people who say, keep getting tested for Lyme's. Lyme, yes. Because Absolutely. it's... Lyme can mimic MS. It can manifest in different ways. Yeah. And also, uh, how did uh, your pregnancy affect your MS or vice versa? I had gone on the autoimmune protocol and had gotten so much better. I mean, just worlds of difference. And um, I got, that's when I decided if we're going to have a baby, we need to have one. Yeah. Now. I mean, I'm 34. I'm not getting any younger. Right. And I had been so sick that I kind of woke up and said, maybe I do. Right. Want to have a baby. Right. And so, um, well, you guys must, this must be your, like your first love because you, you've been together for a while. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it's, it's really, it's really neat. I'm glad that we did it. You know, I'm, I'm on this side of it going, wow, I can't imagine if I had not done it. That's right. So there are so many people that I've met on the autoimmune protocol, like myself, who've, who've just had wonderful results from it. They feel better than they ever did on the medications better than they ever have in their life. I, I felt as healthy as I've ever been right before I got pregnant. I've still got some, some pregnancy weight to lose, but the autoimmune protocol changed my life That's completely. And, and it drove home even more what I'm doing here. Because that's what, you know, those are the foods that are recommended. Greens, vegetables, fresh vegetables, fresh pasture-raised meat. That's, you know, 
bone broth and offals are a big part of it as well. What's offals? Uh, offal is like liver, heart, eating eating oh. organ meat because there's certain nutrients that you can only get in there. It took me from feeling like I thought I was going to die to, you know, super healthy. Well, you're radiant Thank now. He's <laughs> <laughs> a good companion pig though because you never want your pigs to be alone. And when we're switching around the herd and moving pigs and stuff, he's always able to go with somebody else. And that's a male and a female, but... but... He's a barrow. He's been cut. Okay. Yeah, this is just her buddy while she waits to... Wilma and... And pork chop. Pork... Oh. Yeah. His name is pork chop, but he's not going to be a that's pork chop. Right. That's okay. right. Okay. Wilma, when she gets out, she heads for the neighbor's yard where there's lots of acorns. Yes, pretty girl. We're talking about you. No, native bees in. Mm hmm Is this a native bee? This is um, burgundy okra, and it's one of those crops that I know that when I put it in the ground, it's going to grow here. It's so wet and humid here, it just sprouts up, and by the time I'm done harvesting all these plants, they'll be well over my head. Oh wow, and really? I saved um, burgundy okra seeds. These were not from saved seeds, but the first few years that I, I grew here on the farm, I, I used seeds a few years in a row of this burgundy, and then I grew a different variety last year, and I went back to my burgundy. And these flowers are absolutely stunning. It's gorgeous. Okra, um, grilled. <laughs> I love grilled. Oh, I've okra. never grilled okra. Pick them. I normally try and pick them about this long, and then um, I will toss them in a bowl with a little bit of salt and a good oil. So avocado oil is a good oil to put at a high heat. Oh. Toss them with the avocado oil and just roll them back and forth on the grill a few times. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Rosie got into it. <laughs> How did she get back here? She knows. If she gets out, she knows that there's a garden back here. Yeah, there are three things you never want to hear yelled across the farm. One is that someone's dead. Perfect. The other, someone's dying. And three, pig in the garden. Oh. <laughs> because pig in the garden, you have to really run fast to, to save <laughs> your garden. Yes, and so Rosie got in here and she got all in these tomatoes and pushed them down and around. And If there's something good to eat, it doesn't matter what you're shaking at them. If they want to eat what's they, what they've got in front of them, that's what they're going to eat. I try and outgrow what's not going to do well. And um, people always tell me they have a brown thumb. And I say, no, you don't. You're just not planting enough. You've got to plant and account for the plants that you're going to kill. And that aren't going to make it. And then that way you have enough that are. This is a moon and star watermelon. And um, it's, it's my favorite melon. And they get huge. Big, big, big round melons and you can see the bees, honeybees and native bees all over it. I love coming back here in the garden and hearing the garden literally buzz with bees. It kind of lets you know you're doing things right. Is that a native bee? It is. I am a representative for Bee City USA for Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a bee city. Look at this. Elderberry grows native in this area. Beautiful. This botanical interest in drop dead red combo. So those are, are they the red ants that yes. sting? Yes. They're cool. terrible. That's one of our biggest problems here. Getting in the pastures, they'll get in your house. I have seen once or twice where a cow has gotten too close or rolled in one or, you know, and you can see them out there kind of scratching. And so we, um, we try and take care of those with the flame weaver. With a what? With a flame weeder. Oh, I've never heard of a flame. Ooh, there's a little bug on your. What is that little? Is that a spider? That's a spider. Spider's good, right? Yep. We leave all the spiders. You never heard of a flame weeder? Um, this is elderberry. It's a really good immune booster. I don't personally eat it or, or use it because of my. Uh, autoimmune issues. People use it to make elderberry syrup. They make wine with it. I'll actually take these berries and do some kombucha with it for my husband. We do a little bit of homebrew. Lucky guy. Yeah. I'm Elizabeth Hewitt and this is Reba Hewitt. Hi. And hi, my name's Randall Hewitt and I have Vera Hewitt. And welcome to our farm. Hi, Vera. Hi, Reba. Hello. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. 
Are they still uh, breastfeeding? Um, they do both breastfed and formula. Since they were premature, oh, they were yeah. in the NICU for a few weeks. And ah. so they had to learn to eat. They were tube fed at first. And so then, and to get out of the NICU faster, you have to bottle feed. That's true. And so ha have they reached their, the, the normal weight by now? And they're almost yes. five months old? Oh, we, we are on the regular charts now. So and they've so caught they've up done big very time. Well. <laughs> so your diet that you're eating is supplying them with a lot of nutrition, yes. obviously. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming to our farm. See you later. I mean, I really want as many people to know as possible that the autoimmune protocol, I mean, it, it saved my life. I don't know, had it not started working, it started working, you know, almost immediately, then I, I don't know that we would even be farming still now because I was so sick. Elizabeth gave me a homegrown, tasty gift for the road. Okay, I'm eating sun-dried tomatoes with basil and thyme. With oregano blossoms, thyme, and a little bit of marjoram from the garden. And I dried them yesterday in my dehydrator together. Mmm. 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 That is so good. Thank you. You're welcome. Mmm. Okay, you saw that. Wait, hold it, hold it. <laughs> And you can see some of the mama cows are a little bit on the thin side and that's because they are ready to wean. And so um, we'll use what's called a quiet wean. It's a plastic so it doesn't hurt. It's a nose ring and it has a flap. And so they can stay with the mom. We don't have to separate them, but they won't be able to nurse anymore. And they don't need to because you can wean calves by four months and some of these calves are going on six and seven months. So they've gotten more than enough milk and mama needs a break now. This is June Bug with the 125 in her ear. And um, you can see she's got a little bit of hip showing. She needs to, she needs her baby to get off of her. They're not coming. Yeah, he's gonna try and call her on. And he locked her in because she's so handle friendly. Some of the cows are, are a little bit safer to be with than others when you're handling the food. Hey, Nanny. Hey, girl. Hi. 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 Follow, follow. Hi. 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 Hey, we're used to all these sounds. Hi. There we go. Yeah, this guy in the back is cool. That's Leroy Brown. Are they the same age? Um, they're all a few months apart. So the first one born in the beginning of December and the last being born in um, the end of March. We lost a cat this year to, to pneumonia over winter. Over. When we were talking about Beyond Organic before, um, one of the main things we do in our garden is cover crop. And if that's something that people aren't doing right now, you really, really should look into it. The cover crop, not only does it, we used um, Crimson Clover this last year, and I'll probably use rye coming up the, in this winter. But the Crimson Clover, it bloomed, it was beautiful, the bees were all over it. And then when you till it in to the ground, it's so much biomass. That, that we've not used any fertilizer at all. Everything's growing back there just off of the cover crop. And that's a, that's a pretty big deal here because here it's really just sand and clay. There's not a whole lot of, we're in the coastal plains, there's not much for the plants to eat. So I, I have been blown away by how well the cover crop has done you know, for, for us and for the garden. We don't mulch, I will age and compost, um, like I said, manure and shavings and stuff that comes out of the garden and we'll use it in another year or two to put on, but I could not put on top of those beds anywhere near as much compost as comes from that cover crop. There you go. And so we grow the cover crop, we let it flower, we mow it down, let it die for a week or two, and then till it in. And then we will cover crop also in the pastures, but that's for to give the livestock a little bit of winter forage and to try and help feed the pastures back. There's a seed company called King Agri Seeds, 
they have done a lot of work with farms that do rotational grazing. There's a program called Amazing Grazing. There's a farm nearby, Piney Woods Farm, that's a, an amazing farm, and um, he really pushes the, the rotational grazing, and they strip graze tight. He has, he has a large herd. We'll use a seed mix called a raised crazy mix, and it has a lot of things. It has some brassica in it, it's got some radish in it, it's got clover, it's got vetch in it. There's a lot of stuff, so it's kind of a mix of things which is good for the good for the pastures and good for the animals. Yeah. So spoiled. They were our first size of original three cows. So they got lots of extra love. This is Otis and Ellie. <laughs> Hi Otis. Hi Ellie. He goes, wait. We ran over here for, okay, I'll take the petting. Hi, Otis. You're not getting in that barn. Spicy, <laughs> <laughs> right here. She's a pygmy. He is, um, he's a pygmy in Boer Cross. Mm -hmm. he hey, Otis, can I see your face? Hi. Hi. Ha, 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 ha.